This is the, or one of the original pictures of the Black River. Uh, the Black River used to be the outlet to the lake, that's down at Brenton. And so all the water came in the Sammamish and flowed down through the lake, out through the Black River and into Puget Sound. And uh, this picture here probably would have been mm, 1880s, I would imagine. But notice the vegetation very close, the trees, the brush. Uh, canoes are the only type of transportation during this era. And it really was kind of tough. Now there was a camp right in the middle of the distance, probably about where Grady Avenue is, or maybe early to the golf course. And there was a, an Indian family that lived there that kind of worked as a way station. Uh, it was quite a paddle to get from Elliott Bay uh, around through to, to Indian Joe's camp. And there was still a couple hours more of paddling to get into the lake. And, uh, but he, he ran this stop there for quite a while. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite slides, I'm going to leave that up for quite some time. Really what this is, is a uh, middle 70s, uh, they were going to start replacing the I-90 bridge. And so a geophysical firm was hired and to survey the bottom, looking for fault lines and all sorts of things. Uh, and they contracted with us to provide a boat to haul them through. And I was able to glom onto this slide. But it's rather unique in a number of, of ways. First of all, here's a profile coming down the side. It goes quite deep. And this is a drawing of the same thing. And this actually is the scarfing of the glacier. Now, 15,000 years ago, or 10,000, I don't know, a long time ago, if you went up to Stevens Pass and walked out, you'd be walking out on the surface of the ice, and you could walk all the way to the Olympic Mountains. One big sheet of ice that was flowing down from Canada. And underneath that, it was pushing mountains, really. Uh, got ground up into boulders, and then boulders into sand, and sand into clay. And that's what really what has formed and what has set the criteria for, for the Seattle, Kirkland, Kenmore area. We've got hills with very sharp uh, scarfing marks on them all the way around. Real, a lot of real sharp cliffs. At the south end of the cliffs, you have a big bull nose because there'd be a mountain of dirt being pushed by this glacier. And when the glacier stopped pushing, there was that bullnose that was not getting round, round, rounded out. That bullnose would contain often sand and gravel. Um, a lot of times it was just pure clay. So that created, has created a lot of our topography and also created a lot of the problems of building transportation east and west. You've got to go from the bottom to the top. Puget Sound is one of these scarfs, the same as this lake was, and it's still 12, 1,500 feet deep. And this is the surface of the lake up here. And uh, this represents about 200, uh, this represents 200 feet. So this is probably 30, 40 feet. And that scarf, if you project it on down, very easily it would go to the 1,200 feet. So Lake Washington used to be salt water, just like Puget Sound is. It was, the lake was formed by two additional uh, geological events. The first one was the explosion of Mount Rainier. I think most everybody in here can remember 25 years ago when St. Helens went off. And we saw pictures on TV of the pyroclactic flow of mud and water and trees that, that filled valleys, filled lakes, spirit lake disappeared, new lakes were created. And that fine silt was pushed down the river, uh, clear into uh, the Columbia, uh, creating new valleys and re really recontoured the, the, uh, the whole landscape. Same thing happened here at Rapid. When Mount Rainier blew, that pyroclastic flow came down into the, what was the lake, 
or the salt water, and filled and pushed back, and it got as far as Renton before you know it exhausted itself. And so that created the dam or the dike at the south end of the lake. So really, from Mercer Island to Renton, it, the lake's only about 30 feet deep. From Mercer Island to uh, Arrowhead Point in Kenmore, it's about 205 feet deep. And in Kenmore, it shallows out and it's about 20 feet uh, and bulldozes off to the, to the deeper water. And that was created when Mount Pilchuck blew a few thousand years after Mount Rainier blew. And it blew the same stuff from the, from the north heading south and filled in the north end of this lake, as well as Lake Sammamish and a lot of the other territories. So geology has played a, a, a huge uh, part of the lake. But a couple of things of interest, it's really just a big bowl. In other words, if we've got 30 feet of water at Renton and 30 feet of water at Kenmore and there's nothing in between except this deep water, that water is languid. It just lays there. It doesn't <coughs> flow. It doesn't flush. And so as a result, the water in the lower areas of Lake Washington is about 34 degrees. And one of the anomalies is the lake does not give up its dead. We've had people go off of boats, drown out here in the lake, and when they go down, unless somebody goes down to, to try and find them, they'll never come back. Because this lake is so cold, the decomposition of the body is so slow, that it just can't get uh, regenerated or generated enough gas to lift the bottom. This slide also has a lot of other real interesting anomalies. These lines here, we never could figure out what those were until we went back a second time and we ran temperature correlations. And what those are are stratifications of different water temperatures that this electronic equipment was capable of picking up. And you'll notice there's one here, one here, and then one down in here. This is the very coldest part of the lake, obviously. But this lake also has a tendency to roll over. Now, I haven't seen a good rollover since probably the middle 70s. In the middle 70s, we were having a lot of very cold weather. The north end of the lake would freeze from Kenmore clear out to Arrowhead Point. Uh, the whole bay down at uh, Renton would freeze over. And the ice actually at Kenmore was about a foot thick. And, and uh, we walked quite a ways out on it and still no problem. Uh, but that's very, very cold water. Now, temperature phenomena is pretty simple. Heat rises and cold sinks. So the surface water becomes colder than this mid-zone water. And when it does, the mid-zone water wants to come up and the cold water wants to go down. Well, if the surface is extremely cold, it will settle all the way down to the very bottom of the uh, column and replenish that bottom water. And when this happens, it'll happen uh, just like a big boil. Uh, the, water will, uh, the lake will actually roll over. The ice and the cold water will go down and warm, it'll get replaced with warm water. When that happens, the lake also turns black. 1854, Captain George B. McQuellen, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Vancouver branch, came up to reconnoiter the Puget Sound area because the Alki Point people were coming and thought they better do something. And so he contacted a, a native who paddled him around and he named the White River, the Green River, the Cedar River, and the Black River. Now, he was using the color of the water to identify and describe. And the water coming out of Lake Washington was black. And I mean really black. 
still is now. Uh, when we have a, well, this past well, a month ago, we had some cold weather and then it started to warm up a little bit. And there was a slight roll or an exchange. And we, we had black water back in the marina again. Not really heavy, dark black, but you could see that the texture turned from a kind of a bluey, whitey to a real definite black. So all of that happens within these zones here. Uh, the lake also has a, an, an unusual phenomenon in that it has seven sunken forests. Now these forests uh, have trees in there that are literally that big around. And the reason I know is in the 60s, uh, we had a 24-foot um, Chris Craft plywood boat with two guys and a, and a child on it uh, down off of Denny Park. And why the boat sank, I can't remember, but the one fellow had a life jacket. There was only one other life jacket, and the father and the son apparently were trying to save that life jacket to get themselves to shore. But with water temperature so cold, your body strength is sapped very, very quickly. You just can't function. And both of these man and his son went to the bottom, just off the Diddy Park, probably holding on to that life jacket. We never found them. However, I did put on scuba gear and we were out trying to recover. We did find parts of the boat, but I got down here to the bottom. It was about uh, 185 feet and was swimming south and I ran into this tree that's off, actually that big around. And near the top, within about 30 feet of the surface, is the top of the tree. So that tree is probably 100, 150 feet tall. And there are literally hundreds of them in there. Now that's just the one at Denny's Park. There's Sunken Forest by uh, Lake um, Mercer Island, uh, over in the Seattle side, uh, South End. Most of them are kind of around Mercer Island. But this represents here the geological representation of how those sunken forests got there. Um, I live in, in Arrowhead, and we have a little stream that comes down right along Juanita Drive. <clears throat> and in between Juanita Drive and the, and the lake, there's quite a gully developing. And it keeps eroding down and eroding down. And pretty quick, we're going to have the same situation existing that, that created the sunken forest. This is a slump. This actually sat clear up on the hill, just about on top of the bridge or the uh, tunnels on Mount Baker. And a stream cut down through, and we've got layers of clay, and we've got another layer of sand, and might even have a little bit of peat in there, and then some real fine clays, etc. And if you get cut down through, and water can get to a layer of that real fine clay, it will lubricate it. And so you get a, a stream or a seep going through it, and now you've got a bowl full of jelly. And we get one of our good earthquakes, and we get that good shake, and it'll start moving off and come down off the side of the hill and head for lower water. Now, this happens, well, in glaciation, every once in a while there will be an anomaly rock. That's, it might be in clay, it might be in sand, all little, little tiny uh, rocks or something like that, and then all of a sudden there will be a big round boulder. Well, that's kind of an anomaly for the type of, of conditions that it's in. And this is an anomaly rock that used to set up on top of Mount Baker. And when this slump went over, the rock came down with it, and it's acting as a cap. If we went down and took a little dynamite and we popped that off the side and came down, the rest of this would slump off uh, and you know fill in the bottom. But until then, it'll hold its shape. 
because of that cap. Um, Chip? Yes. How long did it take to slide down? Is that like generation? No, no. Probably 10 minutes, 5 minutes. It would be a catastrophic event uh, in conjunction with the earthquake. In many respects, we see that when we have an earthquake and we have uh, cuts where trees will break loose and come down. Uh, a recent one was up on the Stillaguamish River. They had a slide that came down and dammed off the river uh, back in the 70s. But it, it's, it's rather dramatic. Uh, here we have an earthquake running. It's running, this is running north and south, um, just about the east channel of, of Mercer Island. Now, it also goes over and joins up with another one that goes underneath the kingdom. The geophysicists were talking about this in the late 60s, but the people at the Kingdome in the 70s and 80s all of a sudden discovered this new hazard that existed. Excuse me. The lake is really a, a, a marvelous body of water. And the reason that, uh, I've I got to get back into this black water. The reason it's black is that for centuries, We've had wood and debris come floating down and accumulating. Uh, Captain, um, I just told you his name, McQuillan, George B. He described Lake Washington as a putrid body of water, not fit for man or beast, because it was filled with bark, limbs, debris, black, and it's really tannins out of the, the bark and the, and the tree acids that are creating this. Also at the north end, what I didn't tell you, was there's probably from here down to here filled with peat. Now when Mount St. Helens blew, remember they talked about all the trees that were blown over and deposited over a ridge? That's what we have at Kenmore. So there's probably 12, 1,500 feet of that stuff. It's got some layers of sand near the top and in clay, but mainly it's just peat going straight down. And this is where they were talking about putting a multi-story shopping center in Kenmore. <laughs> uh, I, I'm having to go around my city in Kenmore. They want me to get a building permit when they said I didn't have to. And one of the things they've now come out, they want me to get a ge uh, geologist to uh, examine the soils and identify them. And they want a, a uh, geophysical technician to evaluate the earthquake hazards. I can tell them very simply. It's made up of a relicted lake bottom, rated with sand, peat, and, and uh, quicksand, clay, and regular sand. Uh, in case of an earthquake, it will liquefy instantly and everything will float and dismember itself unless you properly prepare for it. But why do I have to spend $10,000 to bring in an expert to recite the obvious? I don't know. I don't know. Let's kind of leave that. <laughs> We're glad you don't live here. Well, right? oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'll get to him. Somebody said something about your shoreline plan being up for review. Your consultants haven't got the foggiest notion of what the hell they're talking about in shorelines. There is no ordinary high water mark, and that's all they want to talk about. But there never has been an ordinary high water mark established on Lake Washington. There's only been an inner harbor line and an outer harbor line if you purchased your second class shorelines. Uh, they also talk about they want to have soft beaches in order to restore it. Now, a soft beach means that you come back in here and you braid this off and put sand and little rocks on there and they're going to stay. Phooey! It's straight down! <laughs> This was kind of 
of the way swamp or uh, the Sammamish Slough looked before the lowering of the lake and early on in its history. Uh, and you know, Seattle was settled in 1854. By 1860, the uh, Yesler Mill was in operation. Uh, I'm going to kick ahead a couple here. Mm. Uh, and in 55 and 56, this was kind of the downtown plan for Seattle. We had the Tide Marsh, we had a point of land that came out with King Street, the Esther Mill was on the end. They were cutting the trees along the westerly slope, sliding them down the muck into the lake, or into the Puget Sound, and they would you know, float them over to the mill and saw them. God, this worked great until about the middle 60s, and all of a sudden, they had pretty well denuded all of the areas that the trees could slide down to the salt water. So then they started in on the top of the hill. And Yesler, in order to make, uh, make it easy to get his logs down, created King Street. Or Yesler Avenue, excuse me. Here's Yesler Avenue. And it goes from the shoreline, which was First Avenue, not Western where it is now, all the way up over the hill and then back down to Lake Washington. And it was all clay, and so they would pump water out of beaver ponds up on top, keeping the lay clay somewhat slippery. And they would slide the logs down Yesler Avenue to get them in. They could bring logs for quite a distance with horses or whatever in order to continue the feeding of the logs. The 60s, 70s, uh, he starts running out of this, this option, and so they have to come into the lake. Now this would not be unlike the Black River as well as the Sammamish Slough. It meandered, it was flat, it was languid, it had a bunch of this brush that would grow up and restrict the water. You can actually see some vestiges of the Black River on the Burlington Golf Course. We're back against the toe of the hill, and you can see where the water was only probably about a foot deep. And so logs couldn't be taken out of Lake Washington uh, most of the year. The only time they could get the logs out is when if we had the rains and snow like we had here in January, usually in November. <clears throat> they would stack logs from Renton clear up past Mercer Island. When the creek came up, they started shooting these logs down the river and out into the salt water and they'd corral them out there and seen pictures and I, I, there's one I really want. It's showing three guys with a pipe pole. One guy's got about four rolled up sticks of dynamite. He's smoking a cigar and he's got one of these sticks in his hand. And he's running out on the logs because of the jam. And he'd light the fuse, give a pitch, and keep on going, and blow the, the jam apart to keep the logs moving. Because they know it would only have maybe a week to move a year's supply of logs up the Black River. Now, humans are pretty ingenious. This is a funny looking cut. Uh, it was really made just about where the Evergreen Point Bridge hits Seattle over there, here in Portage Bay. And this is a log weir that Charlie Pike built in the Middle Ages. Now, railroads had come through, and railroads were built with Chinese laborers. The Chinese, the railroads were done, they had a lot of labor around. So he hired these guys, and they dug this thing by hand. And you can see the logs coming through one by one. Charlie would charge a penny a piece, a dollar a piece, I don't know. But he would charge to bring the logs through. Then they would hit Portage, Lake Portage. We call it Portage Bay now, we see how the yacht is. But there was a creek then that went into Lake Union. Lake Union was quite a bit lower than it is now. And in Lake Union, they'd gather them up, take them over to Berg's Landing. I don't have a picture of Berg, but Berg had a 
set of locks just like this that he built underneath the Fremont Bridge. And so they would load this, the, the locks up with logs, open up the downhill side, and down Ross Creek would, would go the logs. But they were able to move logs year round through this process. It may have been slow, but at least they could start getting them out. Now, I can identify this as roughly the 1880s and 1890s because of the, the cut on the trees. In other words, these are pretty well cut out. The other side of the lake here is still pretty forested. So, the logging, a lot of timing can be developed as to when logs were cut and replanted and re regrown. I have a place out of window with my son. It was logged in about 1902. Those trees were mature and we took them out here about four or five years ago. But that's just the normal regrowth cycle. Uh, but a lot of ingenuity went in order to try and keep things going. Until the 80s, the only form of transportation were these kind of rowboats and canoes. In some of the Redmond historical stuff, they have some talks of people who would take two days. They would load their canoe with eggs and produce, and they would start paddling down the Sammamish River, get to Kenmore, cut across to Leshai, or to Madison Park, and then walk up over Madison to downtown Seattle in order to sell their, their produce and get some cash and come on home. But it was this form of transportation. You guys doing the, the shipyard work, when did the shipyard actually start in business? 1907 or 1908? That late? 1920. 1907, 1920. That was what shipyard are you talking about? Any shipyard. Over Anderson here. Steamboat built that. Yeah. And that would have been in the 1880s. In the 1880s. Oh, okay. But he was still building flat bottoms. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, where was the Anderson yard? Uh, where Lake Washington shipyard is. Still down in Howland. Carolina. Oh, that's Howland. It's not. Oh, 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 This was one of the early, you know, uh, round bottom steamers that started working the lake in the 80s and, and the 90s. Again, you can see the denuded hills, uh, but that replaced people having to, to paddle all the way to, to Seattle. But Madison, Kenmore, and Juanita, uh, uh, Covington, uh, Kennedale, and Bellevue were kind of the major ports. Um, and this was a, just a private passenger that went around. Backing up, this is the steamer Squaw. This is the one that went up the slough uh, into Redmond. And it had to be a flat bottom because everything was so shallow. And also, it had to have a stack that could be dropped over. So that meant this was a steamer. It had a little, probably, single-stage steam engine in it. Say it again, the stack had to be what? Hinged. You had to be able to tip the stack yes. over. Why? Well, because there was low-hanging bridges and things between Kenmore and, and uh, Redmond that you couldn't get under without tipping your stack. And the height of the vessel was just enough to clear the bridge. Now the first bridge that I've been able to come across was at, was at Wayne Golf Course, at Wayne Curve. Uh, you know, the hill is kind of notched and pretty tight. Uh, somebody built a log bridge across there in the 1890s that provided the first link between the, the upper Juanita area and the Bothell Woodenville area. But before that, everybody had to come on around and uh, either get off it. Um, Matt Lear had a landing at Lake Forest Park. The Sills brothers had a, a landing at Kenmore. 
there was the bucket of blood tavern in Kenmore that lets you go up uh, what's now 68 and then you could get into the city of Bothell landing about where Wayne Curve is now. Uh, you really couldn't go from Bothell to Juanita without getting back on the water and going around because of you know, being cut off of the, the slough and everything else. Transportation continued to you know, develop. And here we get to one of my favorite parts. Um, I indicated I could cover a whole range. And I'm going to back off now and, and I'm going to start talking about some of the uh, property rights issues relating to the lake. Uh, prior to statehood, the federal government would sell tidelands and shorelands. And since the federal government owned them, you know, that was available for sale and many people bought their tidelands. Uh, when the Constitution was framed, there was a big argument over riparian rights or states' rights. And one little sentence got into the Constitution. If I get into my notebook there, I can dig it out for you. But it made the statement that the state you know, shall prevail in matters of ownership. And so what this has meant is that the state claims ownership of all of the water in the state. This was first tested in the 1890s in a court case called Angle Lake uh, versus King County. The property owners around Angle Lake, it was a small beaver pond, uh, had, had their lake, they had their boats on it, they did their thing. There was a small triangular area that was acquired by King County for a park. And they started letting riffraff get onto the lake. That upsets people on the angle lake. I think I don't. Anyway, big, big property rights case. And the courts, up to the Supreme Court, held that since that was an enclosed body, that everybody owned a pie to the middle but nobody had a right to deny somebody else the use of the water. In other words, it couldn't be totally restricted. 1900, Seattle was struggling. Uh, they had developed on First Avenue, Second Avenue, you know, whatever. But uh, they really needed something to get themselves going. Now, the Denny's had donated a lot of downtown space for a university. And that's why we have University Avenue between 4th and 5th. That was the, the Denny University of Washington. But then that got to be kind of high value property. But they've acquired other properties in and around it. And so going from then until now, we have the University of Washington owning about probably 20%, maybe even 25% of downtown Seattle. Most people aren't aware of this. And it's operated on a very legitimatized, commercialized basis. They have property managers, they get the highest and best rents. Uh, you name it. The Olympic Hotel is part of the university properties. Uh, the university was kind of plugging up the downtown and I don't know whether I can use Peter Kirk's name and name around here or not. You guys are kind of akin to him, you know. So I have there. But some of his buddies uh, really had grandiose ideas, not only for downtown, but railroads, Lakeshore and Eastern coming around, and steel mills, and a lot of coal mines over here. Uh, and so, in order to kind of create a new Seattle, the Seattle guys won an Alaska Yukon Exposition in 1908. And they went to the legislature. Now, this all starts just about the turn of the century. And the guys from Eastern Washington and Olympia said, oh, no, no, we don't want anything to do with that. We're not going to fund it. We're not going to be involved with it. So King County people not wanting to be outdone passed a, a law that says that 
the state will sell the second class shore or the shorelands on Lake Washington, and the money from the sale of the shoreland shall be used to finance the Alaska Yukon Exposition. <laughs> now, most of the people who lived on the lake around the turn of the century were our money class. Oh, uh Denny -oh, had a 40 acres over here on the east side that was now a big park. That was his summer home, and a lot of the folks had summer places out here. Uh, and so they said, sure, we want to do this. This is our community spirit. Kind of like that forward trust stuff that you <laughs> uh, And about this same time, there was a lot of people in the state, I'm going to keep talking and go back and pick up a book, uh, talking about, well, this is unbridled activity. All this stuff going on, uh, just you know, there's no plan, there's no regime, and so we got to do something. Now, keep in mind the 1908 date. In 1907, a group of citizens from Seattle put on the ballot a measure to create a municipal plan commission to be tenth of one percent on your property tax or ten mills. I don't remember. It's something like that. And it got voted down. 1908, the Yukon Exposition got funded with the sale of this, the shorelands. And so it was again put on the ballot, and it went down. 1909, it reappeared on the ballot. Three years running, and finally it passed. Now, with the election in November of 09, it was middle of 010 before anything got going. And on September 15th, I think it's September 15th, I can find it. The Municipal Plan of Seattle was published. And in this plan, and, and this was in a pile of trash at uh, the downtown branch of the Seattle Public Library, being thrown away back in the 80s. Yeah. Is this, and you piped it. this is awful. This is an awful document. It, uh, it was done by eminent engineers and planners from all over the world. They used the world as their example. Um, under transportation, separation of grades on the tide flats, steam railways, rapid transit, the Arrow Bay Tunnel, interurban service, street and railways, and ferries. They were all considered as a part of this plan. Their arterials were to be 250 feet wide, major streets to be 125 feet wide in order to carry traffic. Now the car had just come about. And so this was a very visionary document. But for some reason, municipal planners hate this concept and refuse to even talk about it. I, I have no reason why, to know why. But a marvelous, deep, uh, a, a tremendous amount of detail in their map, laying roads and, and rapid transit, tunnels underneath the ship canal, etc. That kind of ties back into another subject that we haven't talked about, and that's the the walkers. Now, while all of this stuff was going on, very quietly, Watson C. Squire was our next to the last territorial governor. And Watson C. Squire probably asked the, the territorial engineer, where is the best place for me to invest some of my father-in-law's money? His father-in-law was Frederick Remington, Remington Arms. And so the engineer selected Kenmore from about 67 to 68 and from the water on to the north. Why he did that, I don't know. But anyway, uh, Squires ended up with that ownership uh, before statehood. The last territorial governor was Eric Semple. And, and you can imagine that Remington was probably a Republican. Uh, the last territorial governor was a Democrat. Uh, Eric 
example. If he bought all of this tide land from here all the way down past Spokane Street for 10 bucks. <laughs> oh, he's also the same guy that uh, had the great idea now. He, he owned this tide land. Of what value is it? None. So he designed, de designed a canal to run from salt water to Lake Washington. Came through where the Kingdom is, the Dearborn cut, you notice that nice cut? He did that. And he was going to go into the Rainier Valley, go around the toe of the hill and into the Black River and come back into the lake. Uh, the only trouble is the railroad had already run their rails in line between him and his tight flats. But he didn't care. He built a flume and he's sluicing all this material over top. And it's getting all over the railroad cars. And the engineer you know, go by and get dumped on. <laughs> they got a little bit pissed. So they sued over air rights. And this went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And it affirms that a person, a person who owns property also owns the minerals underneath it and the air above it, unless it's been eased off or for some other purpose. How high? And up at in infinity, I guess. I don't know. I don't know of any restrictions. But anyway, that case came, it's a very simple trying to fill these tight flats. When I got here in 60, they were still filling on them and still selling them. Uh, canal. Starting, well, 1890, what, 1892, our statehood? 89. 89. 89. Yeah, but that's when it voted. Did we become in 89 or in 90? 89. 89. 1892. Harbor, River and Harbors Appropriations Act, our junior senator, Watson C. Squire, got included in that funding for the study to create a ship canal to connect Lake Washington with seawater. Now, this is 1892. Yeah. Three years. Three years after he got into Congress. Pretty good for a junior, junior uh, senator. Uh, the bureaucrats didn't want really to do it. So it, well, this project languished. Finally, in 1902, Coast Geodetic, uh, which is part of the Department of Commerce, finally got on the ball, and they came out and they did a topographical survey of Lake Washington. It took in 105 miles. Now, where do I get my information? Uh, each year, government aid, federal government agencies have to make a report to the head of their agency. Now, this happens to be Director of the United States Coast and Atlantic Secretary of Commerce, for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 1920. And it, in here it tells what Coastal United did in 1919 and 1920, since June 30th is the end of the fiscal year. And so they describe what they've done on each of these projects. So up until 1902, there's nothing. 1902, they run out and they put in 105 monuments around the lake. And they do a topography map. And this is the first mapping that was ever done. 1904, they thought, well, we better check some of these. So they came back and checked. And they couldn't find their previously set monuments. And so they redid the entire survey two years later. And out of 102 set, only nine were undisturbed or not having been previously relocated. So most people kind of thumb their nose. I mean, who are these idiots coming out here and saying, this is a corner of my property. I bought from this stump out to there, and then over to here, and that's the way it's described. So we started having a little bit of conflict. Well, 
we're going to have a ship canal. So starting at about 1905 and 6, the Koshia Deddy went through and they did a sounding survey to determine the depth of water. Now, I question the accuracy of that survey on the following grounds. They have survey lines where they sound lead going right through Southern Forest. And there's no notice, no indication there's anything wrong. Just same numbers right on down the line. Might have been a little bit of midnight survey. I don't know. But based on all of this then, the Corps of Engineers started putting together the Lock Project. The Lock Project culminated in 1916. September, uh, they dug through and drained the lake and, and the lock started operating. I haven't got these all necessarily in order. Now, in the report to the Secretary of War, the U.S. Engineers makes the statement that Lake Washington was lowered at the rate of inches per day starting on September 16, 1916. Now, that ain't inches per day. See the two guys over on the left? They used to be standing over here. But they stepped around the other side to start digging the first shovelfuls of dirt out, and that water started cutting so rapidly. Actually, there was two others over there. There were four of them. Two of them got across, and the other two couldn't. And they finally had to fall back as the, as the water just cut the earth out and lowered the lake. Now, the problem is, and this is where I started to get involved in the history. Simple question. How much did they lower Lake Washington? Nine feet. Oh, what is there nine feet? Huh? I'll show you 12 feet. I'll show you 8 feet. 16. I've seen that one also. Okay, let's, let's go back into a little bit of the geological history of the lake. Black River. Black River vegetation would grow. Our climate normal cycle is that the 4th of July it's raining, the 5th of July it turns nice. And it stays nice until about the middle of October with little or no rain. There's no real body of water that feeds Lake Washington. We get some creeks that come down through uh, Issaquah and into Lake Sammamish, Lake Sammamish to, to Lake Washington. Oh, we have Norton Creek and we have Juanita Creek and we have Swamp Creek. But these are piddling little streams. Hardly enough, I don't think, to cover the evaporation losses on a 35 mile by 4 mile body of water like this. That would be some tremendous evaporation. So this lake level Normally, you'd think it would go down and down and down during the summertime because of reduced stream flow. It didn't. It kind of crept up a little bit because all the weeds and the growth down in the Black River would choke it up. And so the water, what water coming in, really couldn't escape. They did all of their soundings in September. Now that tells me that it's probably at about its lowest ebb that we would see. The only trouble is nobody ever that I've been able to find has said, well, we started out here in Salmon Bay. And we looked through our little glass and we said it's five feet higher there, and five feet, so the lake level was 25 feet. Nobody ever seemed to have done that. At least I can find no records of it. So nobody really knew <coughs> the elevation of Lake Washington. When the Corps of Engineers designed the locks, they designed it to be 25 foot of draft, and all of the navigation data in and around Lake Union, Lake Washington, was to be 25 foot. 
And the feds only talk about a peer headline. And the federal peer headlines in early teens, before the law of the Lord, were drawn in Lake Washington at the 25 foot mark. 25 foot, if I go back to the geophysical slide, you know, it's about 10 feet off the shore, you're down 25 feet, because, you know, bottom or the shorelines are dropping off at a very sharp rate. But if you're at Kenmore or if you're at Renton, 25 feet is all the way out to the Arrowhead Point. And from Renton, it's almost to Mercer Island. So a bunch of the people at the state, this is now our lands commissioner, didn't think that was right. So they started a confrontation against the Army Corps of Engineer, Engineers and property owners starting to uh, try to <coughs> negate this federal project. It's interesting if, I don't have a slide that I can pop up. So next time you go to the locks, walk over to the fish ladder, and as you're coming across, there's a couple of interesting things. There's a, a coffer dam there, and you see these shields that go down. And on top of the shields, you'll see an extension about the high. Now, all of the bracing and everything else goes to the main body of the shield. Now we've got this two or three foot thing on top of it. And if you walk over and you look into the side of the fish ladder, they have a, a, a gauge for water height above sea level, and it goes all the way up to 25 feet. And all of the design criteria for the locks was 25 feet. But when they lowered the lake, the lake came down to 20 feet or less. I say or less. And they got back and they started looking at the locks. Two different engineers were. The locks were built using plans from the Panama Canal. They brought a set of plans up because it was under construction at the same time. And Chittenden took those plans and he built our Seattle locks. They're exactly the same uh, configuration, drawing, refill, tunnels, everything, doors, configuration is all the same as Panama Canal, only it's small. But that was a different contractor than working the other side. Also in that, in about 1910, Coastal Geodetic decides they want to change the definition of sea level. So from mean low, low water, they move sea level to mean low water. It's probably about four feet difference. The contractor building the locks was using the old, the, the old sea level. <coughs> the contractor building the, the fish ladder was using the new definition. So he's got his up where it belonged in the locks are about five feet low. Hmm. Now if you look, there's a concrete pour on top of the locks. It's just about that difference. Uh, uh, the lake, nobody really knows what the elevation was. When the lake was lowered, <coughs> in this process, the municipal plan does not address it, but the legislative, the land, our commissioner of lands does, in that he expected all of the land that would be exposed when the lake was lowered would be titled to the state because the state owns all the water. Mm -hmm. And so he proposed having a boulevard all the way around the lake that was called Lake Washington Boulevard. There's only a couple of small places where Lake Washington Boulevard exists. There's one, is one over on the Leshy side, there's another. There's some Lake Washington Boulevard down the rent area. But up in Kenmore, where I am, they showed a boulevard going right down through the land that was exposed. And the land was then owned by Fulton Tell. And, uh, oh, well, there's more court cases with both the Talbot involved with this and, and the chicks ticket. But anyway, uh, 
Well, before that, or let's get before they leave over. They're, everybody's trying to come up with what's going to happen. The state did their soundings, and then they deducted eight feet off of their soundings and made that a zero. And from that zero, they said, well, this is where the land will show when the lake is lowered. When they lowered the lake, the land that showed was way out here. And so the state says, well, we'll take all of that too. So we have a 1911 drawing showing the state taking the land for Lake Oregon Boulevard. It changes in 14, and in 14, Colton Talbot sued him and won, stating that he can't draw it against the ground that we own in fee because we own the shoreland. On and on and on. Well, in this process, the state drew an inner harbor line and an outer harbor line in 1920. And days before the finalization of that, the mayor and two councilmen from Bothell came over to Kirkland at a meeting that was called the Harbor Commission and started complaining that, gee, we've always had access to the lake, but now with this lowering, we're not going to have access because you know, their river disappeared. So the state says, oh, that's all right. We'll create a waterway from Lake Washington to Bothell. And so they drew on the lines called a waterway. Both and Talbot had been selling lots, guaranteeing people that they own from Lakewood Villa Road, which is now 175th, to the saloon that emerged. So they kept selling these lots. State came along and they said, geez, you don't have any rights to ownership. So they established a retail uh, land sales office over in the Lower Moorlands. And they contracted with an individual to sell to the private parties that land between the river and where the state wanted to close off these people's ownership. The state made Pope and Talbot sue them for quieting the title, first on 10 lots, then each lot individually. And that was starting in 1920. The last suit that I know of was in the middle 80s. The Labiacs <laughs> wanted to build a house. And the state still would not relent and had to sue the state to quiet their title as a result of this project here. Uh, I'm pushing time. I've tried to go very quickly through an awful lot of data, any one of which we can stop and tear apart uh, and dissect in, in a lot of detail. Uh, how about questions? Anybody got any questions? Yeah. <coughs> I'm not familiar with that Erlington golf course. Where's that? Um, It's, it's Foster, uh, oh, Foster Golf Course. Foster. In the old days, they called it Erlington, oh, okay. and I couldn't remember the Foster. Yes. What was second class shorelines? What are those things? First class shorelines is within one mile of the city limit. Everything else is second class. So there was only first class shorelines in Seattle because, it, and there was a little bit over here in Bellevue and Kirkland. And the rest, there's no difference in. It didn't have anything to do with the character of the land. It no, just had to no. do something with the just geographic boundary. Yeah, so. just with the boundary. I lived on the North Shore of the Island for 30 years. Yep. Yeah. And you could live there and you could have your own place. You could definitely see from where the trees were, where the shoreline of where yes, the lake Yes, where they came out and slid in. Where the lake was lowered. Yep, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, very distinctly. A little aside on that, uh, how they found the, the underwater forest. After the lowering, and we had ferry operations uh, before steamboats, cars, and trains. That's, that's Madison Park Ferry Terminal. Uh, they had a ferry that ran from Mercer Island over to Leshai and then one to Madison Park. Medina. Yes. In addition. Yes. And also went down to Kennedale, 
One came to Kirkland, one went into one end. And before that, there was a ferry that went all the way around the island to the different docks. Yeah. And we lived right near McGilvery Dock. Oh, McGilvery, okay. McGilvery was the big owner of South End property along with Watson C. Squire. He's, he had, he profited handsomely from all of this lake. Uh, but McGilvery Dock became a public dock hmm. that uh, everybody could use yeah. to get to the waterfront. Right. Uh, right after they lowered the lake, running from North Mercer to uh, Madison Park, a ferry struck something, stove a hole in the bottom with 122 passengers aboard, and she was, a, I think, a paddle wheel, and they paddled like crazy, and they made it over near Leshi and got it on the beach with no loss of life. But the Coast Geodetic, I mean, they've got egg all over their face. This happened almost exactly in line with one of their sounding marks. Uh, they got together with the U.S. engineer. And the U.S. engineer said, well, the only way I can figure that we could get This is the engineer boat. This happened to be the Preston, which is up in Anacortes right now. Predecessor boat looked a lot like it. Had the two big stacks on the back and the big boom out in front and a clean debris. And it would take it back in and burn it and away it go. But they, they put a timber down on either side, 20 feet, and they put a cable underneath those timbers and pulled it up taut. They chugged along until they hit something. And they said, oh my gosh. And so some guys went down and could see that these were trees. So they figured out, well, if we catch it with that wire, we'll take one end and we'll put a clevis on it, draw it up as a noose, and then we'll back off and we'll pull the tree over. Now, I, it's hard for me to describe how big these areas are, because I really don't know. But they've got to be fairly huge forests down there. Uh, <clears throat> and on the outer edges, I'm sure the dirt and the water and everything else loosened the, the, the roots enough that the engineer's boat was able to pull that tree over and pull it to the surface and get rid of it. So they started in 1917. Now this accident happened October, November 16, and they kept finding these trees that were sticking up. The only trouble is, in two weeks, they had expended their entire year's supply of consumables and had to quit. In other words, they ran out of money. But the Coast and Geodetic felt a little bit of an obligation, so they came over and participated in 18. So between the two, they were making pretty good headway on this one sunken forest off the north end. As they got deeper in, the trees were more firmly rooted. So the engineers would grab a hold of it. Then the uh, Coast Geodetic boat would hook on to the back end of the engineer's vessel, and they would in tandem pull, and they would get a few more of them pulled over. Well, in 19, they were getting pretty well into the middle of that pile, and they had a good hold. The engineer was, that's a paddle boat, he was just paddling like crazy. They brought a second engineer's boat on and hooked it to the stern of the first one, and they pulled the stem out of the Coast Geodetic boat. <laughs> they were able to quickly swing around with the boom and keep it from sinking. In 20, that's when the Preston was built, they had so weakened the timbers that they, she was no longer watertight, nor were they able to keep her watertight because of all the twisting and pulling and straining that had done. And so the Preston was built using the engines and deck equipment off of their original boat. 
fact, you can go up in the quarters and the ship's log is there and you can read some of these stories. Yes? In 1960, I worked for Fox Town and we used to pull log barges over to Kenny to the oh, yeah. uh, Preston Mills. Yeah. And uh, some of those trees, our charts showed where the trees were. Some right. Of the trees, and uh, I understand that they're still there. Oh, yeah, they're still there. They're still there. In fact, there was a guy convicted uh, for illegally yeah. trying to harvest them off of Mercer Island about four or five years ago. Yeah. yeah two questions. Originally, you said the uh, Lake Washington was a salt body, yep. uh, a body of salt water. Yep. And I'm interested in how that conversion occurred to fresh water. And then secondly, could you go over again just how this and where this Black River ran from where to where? Well, OK. Uh, are you familiar with the Renton Airport? Yes. <clears throat> okay, just east of the Renton Airport, there's a creek that comes down through there, mm -hmm. and the Cedar River comes in. Yeah, I know where that is. Okay, the Cedar used to dump into the Black River about halfway between what's now the end of the lake and Grady Way. Mm -hmm. The Cedar made a loop and tied into the black. When they hooked up and tried to start operating the locks, they didn't have enough water to run them all year. So they had to get a new inflow of water to refill the lake. <clears throat> the only stream of substance was the cedar, so it was redirected into the old channel of the Black River. But with the lake being down, 8, 10, 16, I don't know how many feet, the water never could flow out of the black anymore. Mm -hmm. And it was created, the second part of your question is, you know, how did the salt water, when Mount Rainier went off and filled the south half and dammed it off, it quit being salt water at that point. I would imagine over time the salt has probably percolated out and settled. <laughs> this was what, 10,000 years? And then the same thing happened on the north end when the, all the trees and material was brought down from uh, Mount Pilcher, or Glacier Peaks. Excuse me, that was one of Glacier Peaks. But that's how it was created. Mm -hmm. Yes? Have you written the book or are you going to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, and probably not. <laughs> uh, there's, you know, hundreds of stories that can kind of kick off from this uh, of how the state, well, and the state is, is today trying to do the same thing through the Shoreline Management Act. Uh, I happen to have been on the committee that wrote the Shoreline Management Act, the citizens' uh, version that was put up for a vote, and the electorate chose the citizens' version of the Shoreline Management Act rather than the one that the Department of Natural Resources did. And we worked at preserving private property rights where entitlement has occurred in the past. Uh, and DNR now is trying to take all of those back out of the way. They're trying to do it very innocuously by saying, well, we don't recognize harbor lines. We only will recognize an ordinary high water mark, because that's what everybody talks about, ordinary high water. There's never been an ordinary high water mark in Lake Washington. Nobody ever knew what it was. You gotta take it before the lowering or after. <coughs> now, the level of Lake Washington right now is 21.85 feet. Pardon me, I'm wrong. God, first mistake I made this month. So the level of Lake Washington right now is 20.0 feet. That's the normal level of the lake. In order to create water to keep those locks operating, those shields that you see on the top of the coffers between the locks and the fish ladder allow the lake to be raised. The Fed said, well, we meant an average of 25 feet, so really 23 feet would be fine. And the, the face of the, of the uh, shields on top of, of the clobber dam is three feet. 
The only trouble is it's on a radius. Mm -hmm. And so from top to bottom, it's 0.2185 feet. Uh, I can't even do geometry and screw that up. So what is the level? Uh, do we, it's artificially controlled. Uh, people bought and paid for their second class shorelands in order to put on that Alaska Yukon exposition. Uh, for that, they should have some rights in perpetuity. But shoreline management doesn't even want to acknowledge Section 79 of the RCW, which is the one that relates to, to shorelands. And I'll talk to you later if you really want to. No, inside <laughs> of that lock, you're talking about the salt water, the inside of the lock there goes down like this, and that the salt water well, there's a saltwater wedge underneath. So that it drains back out. Yeah. Probably 15 years ago, there was very serious concern about a saltwater wedge that was moving from the locks towards Lake Union. And it had progressed um, up to the point right behind the old Northwest Steel Rolling Mills, which is maybe a half mile from Lake Union. And they finally when in, uh, what, what they have to, to keep the salt water out is a siphon that works at low water. And when the tide goes real low, then the siphon will pull salt water immediately east to the locks out of that bowl that was created and try to keep it from working its way in. They finally put in pumps and pump for months and brought the wedge back. And they say they have it managed now. I don't know. Yes. I don't understand about how how far the lake was lowered. Is there a question about how what the natural height was before? Is that why? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because we have photos, a lot of photos that show where the lake was. Of course, it went up and down, but we have right. a lot of photos. Of oh yeah. It. But, it but the up, topography has changed so much that you can't really pinpoint and identify anything with enough accuracy to, to claim it. Uh, we have pictures of Kirkland though, with the buildings yeah, but, and, and... But Kirkland's pretty simple because you've got pretty sharp sides here and you've got sharp sides over there and you had yeah. a hook. I would imagine the water was probably at the basement of, of this building. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. It was a couple of feet below. No, it was up to the street of the valley. Yeah, yeah, pretty close to the bottom floor of this building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, this used to be the city up here, wasn't it? That's where Kirk's building yeah. was in, in that uh, first town. Yeah. Then they, when the lake was lowered, they moved it on up through the, the swamp. Mm -hmm. Today they would call that a fragile, valuable wetlands. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we ought to return it to the national state. I'm from Kenmore. What do I know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and kind of in answering your question, when the state did their survey, I said they took the, the depth reading and they deducted down the first eight feet. Then they called that zero, and if it was ten feet on their sounding line, they would come down to zero and then one, two, and show the bottom of the two feet, presuming that when the lake would be lowered eight feet, that that's where the bottom would be, two feet underwater at that point. In fact, what happened was that the land that emerged was significantly waterward of those soundings. Now, it wouldn't make any difference along the sharp cliffs because, you know, you might be talking a foot or inches with the sharpness of the, of the uh, fall of the line. So, it's only really at the north and the south end in Maidenbauer Bay. The last case relating to these uh, was a Maidenbauer Bay case in 1959, in which the man who drew the lines, Engineer Sloan, testified that the lines drawn on the lake are not probably not correct and should be relocated should anybody ask for it to be done. I went to ask and I was told not only no, but hell no, and paid a big ton of money for back rent, and I have to pay $35,000 a year to rent the surface of the water in my marina now. 
uh, along that same line. A friend of mine has nine houseboats on Lake Portage Lake, and he has two little moorages that will hold maybe eight boats apiece. Uh, his case just got adjudicated, and he had to pay $422,000 in back rent. And his current rent with the state now for the use of the water for the houseboats is 60% of the rental income. Uh, this, I'm water, I own the water, I have problems with it, so I have a distorted view, but I don't think that's correct. I, I just don't think it's right. So when the lake was lowered, all this valuable downtown Kirkland was created? Yes. So yeah. who, who owned that and how did it get sold? Uh, I have never really looked at the harbor maps. Uh, there's a map at the Department of Natural Resources that I was studying quite a bit in the 80s, 70s, that showed who purchased their second-class shorelands. And I would imagine whoever owned the abutting uplands had purchased those in order to finance the Alaska Yukon Expedition. They purchased it from the state? From the state, yes. That's incredible for And I don't know whether Collins was involved in that or not either. Very well, it could have been. Yes? I think the lake has even gone down more. When we used to swim at Reed and Beach, all the time, we could dive off the dock and be real deep. They had a big high dive and everything. Now, it's kind of not even well, the lake level hasn't changed. The bottom has come up. Oh. And that's the problem I'm having at the north end in, uh, in space. But there's sedimentation occurring at a very rapid rate. Probably not an unusual rate or an abnormal rate. It's just probably the normal rate of sedimentation. Yes. 15 or 20 years ago, I was involved in some of the shoreline management with the state. Yeah. And I think, if I'm correct, at that time, only something like 60% of the lake was the state knew where its line was. Because there was all this discussion about the line of navigability and all this stuff. Only, but, only about 40% of the lake had a def defined inner and outer harbor line. Okay. But, did they make any blanket thing after that, or where no, do we stand? Yeah. It's all in individual cases. So it's individual cases. They they don't want to talk on any macro basis. How about the dredging up there by the slough now? <laughs> Getting over towards your um, uh, How much water have you got over your way now? Well, you've only got about a foot of water over the rifts trying to get out of the slough right now. Uh, no, I know, but I mean over against your. Uh, your marina. Okay, let me go back to 1963. The slough was meandering, and we used to have a hell of a lot of fun racing boats yeah. up the slough. Yeah. And then we had a lot more fun when we put a skier 50 feet behind that boat, and he would go around, and the skier a lot of times would go up over the dirt because he couldn't get out and around. Hell of a deal. Uh, the problem was that some revelers drinking beer on the <coughs> banks was going to walk down on the spit when these guys were cutting across and watch the boat come at him. Well, the boat came up and went over the spit, hit him, and broke his leg. They sued the Seattle Outboard Racing Association, and that was the end of the slew races. But anyway, 63. The Corps of Engineers, well, we got to go back to 1892. Sammamish, Lake Sammamish was also considered navigable and would be made navigable with the lowering of the lake and the logs. But there's about a 15 foot difference in elevation between Sammamish and Lake Washington, grades down through the meandering stream. In 63, the Corps finally fulfilled its obligation and dredge as a flood control project, the slough from Kenmore into, into Lake Sammamish. They got within a few hundred yards of the lake and there were enough people complaining that the lake would be lowered about four or five feet. And they already had their dock in place and they were not gonna spend money to create a new dock. And so the Corps quit and just put a log weir or log dam 
at that point. So Lake Sammamish was left undisturbed. That still doesn't prevent the silt from accumulating and coming down the river. Another little side, somebody asked about an island. Yeah. I, that was you? That island, yes. Uh, well, when the Corps drew up these plans, uh, they forgot and left off the top sheet when they sent them out to the various contractors. So the contractor that was doing the dredging, he's dipping stuff out and cleaning the sides and he gets down to the 68th Avenue Bridge, or the, we call it the Slough Bridge or Kenmore, he starts loading up his equipment and hauling out. And the Corps engineers and inspectors say, hey, wait a minute, you gotta finish your damn job. And they kept pointing out, said, no, here's our specs, here's our plans, this is where it quit. God, we screwed up again. So now they've got it all dredged down except from the river out, and it's really in a, a lot of fingers of water coming out. It's really a delta situation, blocking up all the silt. It, in the two years it took to, re, to you know, recover from this problem, uh, about half of the silt got replaced that should have continued to wash on out. So George, Pioneer Tony George, Kenmore Premix George. I can't think of his last name. He had Pioneer Towing and had taken over Kenmore Premix, but he had an old steam dredge, flat bottom, an old steam plant, which kind of pulled up across from our marina up on its edge, half sunk, and I'll be damned if they didn't come down, pump the water out of that, fire up the boiler, and it started working as a, a dredge again. And they cut a deal with Jack Barron at the golf course. Now, the 8th Green used to be clear across the river, probably another 30 yards to the north. And then the river cut it around it and came clear back uh, to the south and alongside of, of Barron's house. So Barron cut a deal with George cut it straight off, he would relocate the 8th green and run it straight through, and then they just would divide the property between them. And that's what they did. Now that created a real problem out there with Bird Island. Uh, the state claims it's theirs, the uh, barons claim it belongs to them, but uh, just another one of the continuing things that keep showing up. King County was, is supposed to dredge the slough. In 80, probably 85, 86, Kenmore Premix and ourselves prevailed strongly enough to the Corps of Engineers for them to uh, dredge the channel, Kenmore Commercial Channel, into our property because we were guaranteed navigable water, which we had before the lowering, after the lowering. And it took a lot of arguing to get them to finally dredge and provide us with navigable water. Does it fill in again, though? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, up in uh, Marysville, I did an addition on that treatment, that plant that slews, you know, as you yeah. know. And as you to go in there, you go by that marina that's out in the flat. Yep. And on each side of that road, there are big mounds of sand because yep. they they go in there every every year, year to, to, to dredge yep. it. Well, then when they built the new uh, uh, navy base down on the waterfront in Everett, they they color, uh, took all that and all that uh, for fill yeah. down there. But now, of course, they end up moving well, yeah, again. Yeah. yeah, the city of Kenmore has the obligation to now clean out the, the small flu, and I'm starting to work with their people to get the necessary permit started to do that. Yes? When I was a child of about eight or nine, we had a... Was that 1935? <laughs> 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 
the leg. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, oh. So when we, Uncle Ralph had um, a sailboat that had a centerboard. Mm -hmm. So he pulled a centerboard. And we went up the Sammamish River. Mm -hmm. um, in the, um, we went up north and found, we poked around a little bit before we found the Sammamish River. Yeah, which one? We went up the Sammamish River where we pulled up the centerboard. And we've got pictures of it where, um, you know, and then, then they would catch us as we floated down. Yeah. Because we both knew that. Was the bridge in at that time? Was it? The bridge of Kenmore, was that there? I don't, I don't remember. Okay, it probably was not, so it'd be before 1920 or 21. Yeah. Before the bridge was there, if you wanted to go to the Moorlands or the backside of Juanita, you would come into Peterson's Dock. Peterson's Dock was their Englewood Country Club. If you wanted to go up to Briar, uh, you would come no, in. No, it must have been after Silver. 1923, because that's when it was. Yeah, after 1923? Now, the bridge should have been there, but it might have been a small enough boat that you could pass under 16 feet clearance. Yeah, oh, we had a, we had a, the last boat. Uh, I don't know what the last yeah. was. But it was a cat boat. A little cat boat. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much.